Okay, well, this evening we're going to finish uh, Paul's address to the Ephesian elders. Um, beginning in verse uh, 28 through the end of the, the chapter, and again, the emphasis here is on be, you know, being watchful against false teachers, how to recognize them, and then this closing part, which isn't really related to that, is just the love that Paul shared with the Ephesian elders, because that bond of love is really the same kind of love the Lord wants us to have amongst ourselves. All right, so beginning in verse 28, Paul writes this, "'Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood.'" I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that He Himself said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the words which he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Well, this morning, remember, we saw that as Paul was heading to Jerusalem, knowing that he would be arrested for the sake of the gospel and eventually taken to Rome, that he stopped in Miletus to call for the Ephesian elders, that he might give them uh, final instructions, knowing that he would never see them again. And again, he gives them these instructions so that he might help the whole church in Ephesus by dealing with the leaders. He can help the people. Now, he began by pointing to three things from his own life. First of all, his sincere labor for his Lord on their behalf. Remember, he gave them his undivided attention for three years. The Apostle Paul is a very gifted man, very uh, powerfully used by the Lord uh, to devote three years of his life just to this one congregation. is an amazing thing, and he did it, of course, out of love, serving them in meekness, serving them, of course, again, out of his care and concern for them, out of his love, enduring whatever trials came his way from the Jews in order that he might establish them in God's truth. Remember, he didn't hold anything back that he thought would be beneficial for them. And since all the word of God is beneficial, he essentially taught them all that God reveals. Secondly, he pointed to his willingness to pay the ultimate price for his Lord, by setting his heart to go to Jerusalem to suffer, even to die, if that is what Christ had planned for him. And third, he pointed to his faithfulness in proclaiming the gospel, that he had not failed to speak both to Jews and to the Gentiles the whole truth, the whole counsel of God, so that he could honestly say that he was free from the blood of all men, that is the responsibility for their destruction um, if they had not heard the gospel because the gospel is the only way to escape. Now, again, in saying these things, he was giving them an example to follow. And as I mentioned this morning, as Paul reminds the Corinthians, be imitators of me as I also am of Christ. Paul holds out this example or the Spirit of God holds out this example to us also to follow it because this is what Jesus did and what he would do if he were living our lives. But, of course, this wasn't all that Paul had to say. Uh, he now moves to a warning against the danger of false teachers. 
So this evening, I want us to look at three things. I've already told you what those three things are. Um, not only, of course, that there will be false teachers, but where they would come from, how they could recognize and repel them, and then finally, I think a closing exhortation Paul gives for the Ephesian elders to give to their people and to practice themselves to love God's people. Now, first of all, he tells them where these false teachers would come from. He begins by reminding them of their obligation. Uh, let me just say, he begins by reminding them of their obligation to protect the church. Okay, that's why they need to be on the lookout for these false teachers because it's their responsibility to repel them when they come. He says in verse 28, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. Now, notice first of all that, that the Holy Spirit had called them to be overseers. Now, the word in the Greek, and I usually don't like to bring up necessarily the original language, but I think it might be helpful in this particular uh, instance. The original word in the Greek is episkopos, okay? That is the Greek word from which we get the English word bishop, and the word means guardian. Now, some branches of the Christian church, uh, I think you're familiar with them, such as the Church of England, what we call the Anglican Church, or the Anglican Church in America, which is called the Episcopal Church, and again, that comes from the word episkopos, see this office of overseer as a distinct office from that of elder. They see it as a higher office. But I want you to notice that Paul uses the two terms synonymously. First of all, from Miletus, we read this morning, he called for the Ephesian elders. And then he says to the elders, the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers. And he also uses these two terms synonymously in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, where he writes this, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward. So he says, appoint elders. These elders need to be of this moral character. And the reason is because the overseer must be above reproach. Again, using the two terms synonymously. Elder refers to the office that they hold. Bishop refers to the work that they do. And the work that he is emphasizing here is that they are to guard the flock as a shepherd watches over his sheep. Now, this is a very important calling because of how precious these lambs are. Notice that they were purchased at a very high cost, at the cost of God's own blood, by the way, does that, does that strike you as sort of strange that Paul says they were purchased with the blood of God? Okay, I think here we have uh, one of the clearest references to the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ because we know God reveals in His Word that He is an infinite spirit. And as Jesus says, a spirit does not have flesh and bones, it does not have blood, a spirit is not physical, does not have the attributes that we have. So how can God have blood? Well, Paul obviously is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the eternal Son of God, and who took to Himself our nature, that He might shed His blood for our salvation. By the way, this interchange of um, the fact that blood is being attributed to God, it, it's, it seems unusual. There are a few instances of this in the Bible, but um, there is what's called the communication of attributes. Jesus possesses two natures. He's God and man, and there's one person who possesses both. But because there is one person who possesses both, sometimes uh, an attribute of one might be ascribed to um, basically the other nature, uh, God having blood. Here's one example of that. 
Now, the point is, if the Lord purchased us at so high a price, and by the way, He didn't just buy the Ephesian elders and the flock that they're shepherding, but He also purchased us at that cost. Our safety must be the overseer's priority. So what is it that they are to be on the lookout for? What is it that they are to protect us from? Well, Paul tells us in verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And by that, of course, he doesn't mean literal wolves, but he's referring to the greatest danger that the church has always had to face, not a physical threat, one that can only hurt the body, but a spiritual threat, one that can destroy the soul. He's referring to false prophets and false teachers. Jesus warned His disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. That's what He has in mind. Now, He isn't saying here that these wolves or these false teachers can actually destroy true believers. It is true that they can lead them astray. It is true that they can perhaps stumble them for a while, uh, but they can't ultimately destroy them. However, there are those that they can lead to destruction, those who are in the flock who have not yet been converted. They can lead them away from the truth by which they might have been converted. Remember this morning we saw that the, the elders okay, need to make sure that they preach the whole counsel of God so that they might be free from the blood of all men, even as Paul was. But Paul here is saying they must also protect those who are under their charge from being led away from the truth that can save them. You know, they need to watch out for these false teachers and neutralize them or else they can be guilty of the same thing. By their not doing this, these sheep are being led astray, away from the gospel that could ultimately save them. Now, where do these false teachers actually come from? Paul, first of all, says they come from without. He says in verse 29, I note that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. He says they will also come from within, in verse 30, and from among your own selves men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. I think Paul has in mind here, of course, the, the flock itself, but even the overseers themselves, which is why Paul writes in verse 28, be on guard for yourselves, okay, make sure you're not led astray. It's especially important for them because they're the ones teaching the flock. Now, John tells us that in, in his first letter that in his day there were those who denied that Jesus had come in the flesh, that he had come in our nature. And he calls them anti-Christ. Many of these, as I've already mentioned, that's the reason why I read this meditation at the beginning, many of them had come out of the church. He writes again in chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. These false teachers originated within the church itself. Again, the warning is watch out for yourselves, be on guard for yourselves, be on guard for the flock, that, that this seed of error is not sown, that you embrace it or someone among you embraces it and leads a large number of people astray. The, the church has historically been a breeding ground for false teaching, and the reason is because the enemy comes in and he sows the seed of false doctrine. Now, false teachers, as we know, are still a very real threat to the church, and they can lead astray those who at least believe the truth. You know, again, believing it's not enough. You have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow Him. 
I don't know if you knew this, but many Jehovah's Witnesses were once Trinitarian Christians. At least they were professing Christians who belonged to Trinitarian churches, and yet they fell prey to the Jehovah's Witnesses who were anti-Trinitarian. And why did they fall prey? Well, a couple of reasons. First one is probably because they weren't grounded in the truth. They didn't know what the Bible taught. They weren't convinced that the Bible teaches, you know, this, well, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Possibly it's because they were, they were taught, but maybe they didn't listen. Or maybe they just simply, not knowing the Lord, didn't care what the Bible taught, or maybe never embraced it, and they were deceived by the Jehovah's Witnesses. So that's just one example of many different things there are, even within, even within evangelical Christianity. There are a lot of things that are coming up that could lead us away from the truth or could lead um, those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and stumble true believers. We need to be on our guard against them. And that brings us to the second point, how these overseers were to guard themselves and the flock. Paul says in verse 32, and now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now, I would suggest to you this first way that Paul is telling us is prayer. And I think, I think we understand prayer is very important. Paul commended these overseers, these elders to God, which means that he was entrusting them to God. He was looking to the Lord in prayer, trusting that God would keep them, keep them from error. Now, we know that overseers are to pray for us. We know that Paul tells Timothy that, that really we're to pray for all men, for those who are in authority, those who are in the state, as well as, as he said, all men, all who have authority. So, that is a very important thing. Overseers are to pray and they're to pray for the flock of God, that the Lord would continually turn our hearts towards Him and that He would preserve us from these errors that would lead us astray from Him. But let's not forget overseers also need prayer, okay? That's why Paul is praying for them and why we should pray for our overseers. By the way, you know, in Presbyterian churches, everyone has an overseer. Nobody is without, even though uh, currently we have just myself as an elder here. We have a mutual accountability amongst ourselves, accountable to presbytery. Presbyteries are accountable to the general assembly. So there's mutual accountability, and we believe that's very important because, again, no one can do it on their own. We all need accountability, and we all need prayer, and that's why we should be praying for one another, praying for the overseers, the overseers praying for us, each of us praying for one another. But prayer isn't enough by itself, okay? They also need truth. And so Paul also entrusted them to the word of his grace, the word of God's grace to the scriptures. They, the overseers, needed to study the scriptures for their own sake so that they could recognize false teachers and false teaching. But they also needed to study it for our sakes, right? Uh, so that they can teach us to recognize false teaching, to avoid error, so that we might grow in our understanding, that we might grow into the likeness of Christ, that we might be kept safe and be brought safely to our inheritance, make it to the end of the path, make it to the end of the road, make it to heaven. Now, this is one of the reasons why I mentioned earlier that we need to be <coughs> We need to be faithful uh, to attend okay, the services and the midweek studies because it doesn't matter how much the overseers study the Word of God, it's not going to do us any good unless we're actually in those places where the Word of God is being explained and, and applied. Of course, it's also very important that we hold on to what it is that, um, that we hear. You know how in the, the parable of, of the, the sower, that the four different soils, you know, along the path, uh, it's hard, the birds eat it up. The, in the stony soil, in the thorny soil, there's no fruit born because um, 
well, the thorns choke it or, you know, not having depth of soil, the, the heat of a trial burns it. But notice in the one soil where it actually takes root and bears fruit, Jesus says, these are those who hear the word of God and hold it fast and bear fruit. You see, unless, unless you take hold of the word, unless you apply it, there isn't going to be any fruit. So a couple of things need to happen. We need to hear the word. We need to be where the seed is being sown. Yes, Jesus was referring to the gospel, but the same analogy could be used with regard to everything the Bible teaches and this kind of transaction. We need to uh, be where the, the, the seed is being sown. We need to take, you know, understand it, take hold of it, and hold it fast. If we just forget it, it's not going to do anything good. If we, if we forget it, we're basically like the seed that's sown on the, on the path where it doesn't penetrate and has no effect. That's how much the Word will help us unless we take hold of it. Okay, by the way, uh, this is the reason also why we're beginning that new series, uh, the next Lord's Day, uh, the last days according to Jesus, because we don't want to be vulnerable to the enemy's attacks in this particular area. Now, R.C. is going to remind us that, you know, he went to a liberal seminary and they were teaching him one of the main reasons why we believe Jesus wasn't a true prophet and the Bible isn't the Word of God is because Jesus said he was going to come very soon and it's been 2,000 years and he hasn't come. So we need to, to be able to answer those questions for ourselves, but also to answer that for others who may also be liable to believe that lie of the enemy and fall away from the Lord. Now, finally, Paul closes with an exhortation to love. And he again, first of all, points to his own example. He says in verse 33, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You know, I, I'm not in it for the money. He was careful also to provide for his own needs and for the needs of those who ministered with him. Now, he did this for a couple of reasons. He did it not only to stop the mouths of his enemies who might say that Paul is only doing this because he wants to benefit from it, but he was also doing it to give these elders an example. Verse 35, in everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. See, I think what Paul is basically again pointing to here is uh, an example of love. Love gives. Selfishness receives. As Jesus came into this world not to serve, excuse me, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, so now he calls us not to expect others to serve us but rather to look for opportunities to serve others. And he says, first of all, to care for the weak and the needy who are among us, and then for those outside the church. You know, showing this love, the love which our Lord gives to us in these ways, we've noted before is the most powerful apologetic, Jesus said, we could give for the gospel. John 13, verse 35 by this, all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. When the world looks at the church, what do they see? Do they see this love? Sometimes they do. But more often than not, they don't. They see divided churches. They see schismatics. They see, again, people greedy for money. They're in it for the money. They, they don't see this example of love. We need to show the world this love that Jesus has given to us, that he has given to us by his Holy Spirit. That's why he gave us the Spirit. Now, after he said this, he knelt down and he prayed with them. I'm sure that the Lord would bless them, bless their ministry, protect them, keep them in his care so that they might also protect Christ's sheep. Then they began to cry and to embrace Paul and repeatedly kissed him. Uh, as, again, the reality was dawning on them of what he had just said, that they will not see his face again, at least not this side of heaven, okay? They loved him, okay? They loved him. They were going to miss him. They, they, you know, really appreciated his, his ministry. 
And so they wanted to show that to him before he left. They even accompanied him to the ship to see him off. And that's, you know, what, what people who care about other people do. Uh, they will, you know, it wasn't uncommon, for instance, in Jonathan Edwards' day, uh, if they had a guest speaker at the church, that when the person was leaving town, that the, the pastor would ride along with the pastor who had just spoken to the borders of the town to see them off. And we, we do that. We see people to the door. Maybe we see them to their car. And it's, it's a show of affection. Well, how often do we cry, embrace one another, and repeatedly kiss one another? This, this is the depth of love that they had for him. And this is the kind of love that Jesus wants us to have for each other, not necessarily displaying it in this way, okay? We have maybe differing ways to show that. But he wants us to feel deeply and to care about one another. Again, this is why he has given us the spirit of his son, so that we might have this love. So as we think about that, let's hold on to that as well and pray that the Lord would help us to grow in this love. Not only that we might minister to one another, but that we might present this as an apologetic, as an argument to the world, that we are the disciples of one who is real, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? Let's ask the Lord uh, silently in our hearts to apply what we've just heard and to hold on to what we've heard.